We have Shauna with us this morning. Um, so let's welcome up Shauna. <laughs> whoop, whoop. <laughs> you guys are saucy today. I like it. Uh, one of the things that I appreciate, and I think we all appreciate so much about our church family, is, is the multiplicity of voices, right? Um, and today we get to hear from Shauna. So would you all join me? And let's just pray a blessing over Shauna. God, thank you that you speak, and you speak powerfully. Thank you that your word is truth and that the truth sets us free. God, we pray a blessing over Shauna, that your spirit would move in her, that she would articulate your truth in a way that we come to be liberated by your love. Thank you. May you be glorified um, by all that we do here today in, in our postures of hearts as we grow in love for you and one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes. I think, Brianna, you are being influenced by me, which is why you said y'all. So thank you. I like it. I like it. That's right. All right. Good morning, everyone. Ah, what an awesome day to be here. You know, I was just blown away by our worship this morning. And I typically am, but man, oh, forever he is glorified. It's incredible. Freeing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you to the team. They are incredible, um, and I really appreciate them leading us in that matter. Like Brianna said, my name is Shauna, and my husband Scott and I are a part of this body, and we love our church. We love you guys. Um, one of the reasons why I love our church so much is because here we are given the freedom and the space to ask questions and to talk about some of the hard stuff and to wrestle with some things that we've maybe always just naturally believed and, or have been taught before. We are really encouraged and given space and freedom to ask those hard questions and to kind of wrestle with our faith and work it out. And I really appreciate that deeply. It's been an invaluable part of my um, walk with the Lord. And so I think our church is pretty great that we get to do that. Um, that's part of the reason why we're doing this series of Twisted Scripture. Um, I know we've done one before, but um, what we have found is that uh, throughout history, really, um, well-meaning people have uh, taken some of those trickier verses in the Bible and tried to explain them. And sometimes, um, not all the time, but sometimes those explanations haven't been the most helpful. Sometimes um, those tricky verses in the Bible have uh, served as tools to just bring about condemnation or um, things in our life that aren't healthy or have been kind of oppressive. And so while we um, feel like it's important to look at those things, we're not trying to say what everything you've thought is wrong and everything we're saying is right, but we're just saying, hey, here's a possible reframe and maybe another possible way to uh, look at the, these scriptures. Now, I do want to say just from the get-go that um, we here at Woodland Hills believe passionately and wholeheartedly that God breathed the scripture, that he inspired the scripture. Um, we are not challenging his authority in the scripture whatsoever. We believe wholeheartedly that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful. And so we are not saying the opposite of that, okay? So boom, there it is. God did scripture. We believe scripture. We just think that sometimes it's been taken out of context, and sometimes scripture has been used to not further his kingdom, but rather beat people down or make them feel like they are less than what they are, or it's just been a little confusing. So that's why we're taking a look at it, okay? All right. So today we're going to take a look at the book of Proverbs. Not the entire book, because as much as you love hearing me talk, you don't want to be here all day. I'm certain of it. So we're just going to take a look at parts of Proverbs. But before we do that, I feel like we've got to take a step back and look at the big picture, get the big backstory about this book. We all know as humans, we need wisdom to live. Wisdom is important for living. And healthy societies pass that wisdom on through generations. And so when we look at the book of Proverbs, what we are actually seeing is the literary anthology of Israel. Israel's wisdom gathered from diverse spheres of life. Uh, the purpose of this book is to help people to become wise and godly. And we have to remember that in traditional oral cultures, as we're looking at now um, with this book, with these scriptures, mothers and fathers and teachers and leaders in the community would pass on their own life experience and ancestral wisdom to their children, 
both liter literally and figuratively, through the children in the community. So mothers and fathers and leaders and um, elders in the community would pass on the wisdom to the next generation. And so Proverbs is a literary gathering of such diverse wisdom. And as readers, you and I today are all invited to walk along this path of wisdom and, and discover some things. As readers, we're invited to walk along this path, but we do have a problem. Although we can um, find a lot of things that are common sense and a lot of things that we can connect with, there are still a few difficulties in a book whose world and whose culture and whose language is ancient and foreign to us today. Also, we do have to recognize the fact that many times women face additional barriers in applying the wisdom found in Proverbs because Proverbs is addressed to men and presents women in terms of their relations with men. So some women have found Proverbs to be oppressive, and others have used Proverbs to hold themselves to an incredibly high standard, and that's just almost impossible to attain. So we have to remember that when we see those things that um, the male focus of Proverbs is, pr is purely because of the reflection of the fact that um, the society at the time was controlled by men. That was just the culture of the time. So that's what we have to remember, and we can't get bogged down in that. If so if you're a woman, you can be, ah, take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath, and you're set free from that. Now, our tendency, maybe not all of you, but our tendency when we read Proverbs is not to take that step back and look at the big picture. Our tendency in reading Proverbs is to look at it like a book of quotations, a book of inspiring quotations. And then we pull, pull one out and that's like our inspiring thought of the day. We treat it like a, a Facebook post or a tweet, like 140 characters of inspiration for the day. And we pluck it out and this is um, what's gonna get us going through our day. We treat it like it's a bumper sticker. I don't know if any of you have seen them. I have, they exist. A little Proverbs on a bumper sticker and you slap it on the back of your vehicle and that will inspire all those um, trailing behind you in traffic. <laughs> Everybody trails behind me in traffic, just kidding. Um, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that, you guys, but here's the deal. When we just do that, um, we're in danger of missing the whole picture, the full story of what God is saying to us. Now, for an example, we're going to look at a few verses in Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 2 through 6. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. These are encouraging verses. These are some of, maybe even some of your life verses. These are things that you've held on to and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem that we have to look out for is when we read these verses and others like them um, through the lens of, uh, it's like a mathematical formula. You know, if, then. So, something a little bit like this. If we don't forget his teaching and keep his commands, if we let love and faithfulness never leave us, if we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and we don't lean on our under, own understanding, then we're promised long life with peace and prosperity. Then we can count on favor and having a good name. Then our paths will be, be made straight. And the thing with that is, is if you read these verses and others like them with an if-then mentality, and then the outcome that you want doesn't happen, then we have a kind of a little crisis of in, internal faith. We have a tension that we're experiencing. Because guess what, you guys? I don't know about you, but in my 40 years of living, I have discovered that life isn't that linear. <laughs> life isn't that systematic. Life is not a mathematical equation. If this, then that equals this. It, that is just not the way life works. Life is really more messy than that. Life is kind of more like jumbled up and there's other factors and other variables and there's other people and other things going on and it's not just simple A plus B equals C. 
If it were that simple, we'd all be rich, happy, and gloriously ready to meet Jesus. But life isn't that way. We've got other things going on. And so when A plus B doesn't equal C, if when we do this and then that doesn't happen, the desired outcome, we're kind of left with three options. Number one, we may begin to feel that God is not keeping his promises. If we do this, then God's supposed to do that. And when that doesn't happen, I guess that means God is not keeping his promises. We're in danger of maybe beginning to think that. And then getting frustrated and angry with him for not keeping his promises. Two, we may begin to think that Proverbs are just simply promising too much. You know, they're overselling themselves. Because if we do this and we don't get that, then Proverbs must be promising too much. Three, and this is what I suspect is where most of us fall, we begin to assume that we've done something wrong. We didn't do our part just right. We didn't do our if in the exact right way. Our if got jumbled up. We didn't walk the straight line. We kind of went around in spirals and curves and, and kind of meandered through. It has to be us. We must have done something wrong. Uh, when we do that, you guys, what we're essentially doing is treating the scriptures that God breathed, that God inspired, we're treating them like a vending machine. We're treating it like that little vending machine when you go in and you put in your coins, your dollar, whatever, your exact change, you push the button, and then you expect to get what you push the button for. But how many of you know that life isn't always like that? Sometimes you push the button for a Twix and a Heath bar comes out. <laughs> Sometimes you push the button for a Twix and nothing comes out and then you're really upset. Sometimes it doesn't quite take your money. But when we treat scripture like this, that's kind of what we're doing. We're treating God's word, we're treating him as if he were a vending machine, as if his words were a vending machine. We put in, we push the button, and we get out what we expect. It's not really that way, you guys. We're going to take a look at another proverb. And the reason why we're taking a look at this next scripture, I just want to kind of say, is that this particular verse, I know many people have um, been blessed by tremendously. It's been a lifeline for them. And at the same time, many people have really felt a bit haunted by it. It's been a, a, something that they've struggled with. So let's take a look. Proverbs 22, 6. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Now, this verse, like I said, has been a lifeline for many and has haunted others. Now, I don't want you guys out there to think, oh, so this is a sermon about parenting. I am not up here to teach Parenting 101. Not going to do it. I have my own children to raise. You don't want me raising yours. I'll do my thing, you do your thing. That's not what this is about. If you're looking for something about parenting, we did do a series, Relatively Speaking, and you can grab that and listen to that, but that's not what this is. This is also does not exclude those of you out there who aren't parents. This verse pertains to all of us in the kingdom, and if you hang on with me a little bit, you'll see why. Now, personally speaking, um, I was really uh, terrified at the prospect of becoming a parent. First of all, I wasn't sure that I could become a parent. When my husband and I got married, we waited about five years before we started to have a family, decided to have a family or expand our family. And I wasn't sure if that was something that I could do, that something that my body could do. I didn't know this because I, did, I don't know my family medical history. I don't know my family medical history because as some of you know, because I've shared a little bit here and there, I was adopted at the age of 13. Now that means that in the early years of my life, I did live with my birth mother, but I don't know anything about her family because her family disowned her when she married my father, who was an African-American. There was sin going on in the South, y'all. She married an African-American, and so her family disowned her. Um, now, they, that didn't work out. I don't know where he went or why he went or whatever, but I've never known him, and so I don't know any of his family stuff. So I was, I'm a woman, I'm a woman who did not know my family medical history, so I was unsure if I could even become a mom in that way. Um, so I had a little bit of anxiety and fear about that. Scott and I never really talked about if we would have kids, when we would have kids, how many kids we would have before we got married. So these are things I just kind of carried in my heart on my own, just these little fears that I had and these ponderings and wonderings. 
So when the time came that we discovered that we were going to have a baby, a whole other set of fear um, set in. I was terrified because now that I knew I was going to be a mom or become a mom, I didn't know if I could actually be a mom. I didn't know if I, if I knew how to be a mom. Remember, my early childhood was spent with a single mother. It was spent with a lot of dysfunction and a lot of abuse. And there is a reason why that at the age of 13, I no longer lived with my birth mother and moved um, in with another family. There were things that happened in those early years that weren't so amazing, that weren't wonderful at all, that we would never want for any child, let alone our own children. And so that having been my experience, that having been all I knew about young, early childhood and toddlers and preschool and all, I mean, I was terrified. I was terrified because I didn't have a role model. I was terrified because I didn't have an example. I didn't have anyone to follow. I absolutely knew what I didn't want for my children. I absolutely knew that the environment I did not want to create for them. I knew how I, I, that I wanted to love them in, in the best way. I knew what I didn't want for them, but I wasn't really sure that I was capable of doing it because I didn't have anyone to look at and say, oh, that's how you, yeah, that's how you become a mom. That's how you love your kids. That's how you raise your kids. I just didn't have that. So I was really terrified. I had a lot of other terrifying moments. Um, one of them came as I was beginning to ponder what it would be like to um, be, a, be a mom to my son. We knew we were having a boy. And I kept remembering, it kept coming to my mind, um, the fact that when I was in middle school, which is about the time that I was adopted by my parents, when I talk about my mom and dad, that's who I'm referring to. When I was in middle school, um, the school counselor pulled my dad into a, a, a meeting and just said, you know what, we are so thankful for what you're doing for this young girl, and we think it's wonderful, and we think what you and your wife are choosing to do is um, admirable, and we just think that's fantastic. However, we don't want you guys to be um, set up for disappointment, and so we just need to kind of let you know that um, this girl has been through a lot of stuff in her young life, and this girl um, is probably damaged beyond repair. This girl, um, is probably too far gone and will probably never function normally as an adult. You need to know that what you're doing is good and we hope for the best, but when a child has been through this for as long as she has, by this point, it's too late. It's too late. The damage has been done. So, fast forward several years and here I am, an expected mom, and I, I remember those words. The damage has been done. It's too late. She'll never be able to function as a normal human being, a normal woman in the world. I was terrified. I was terrified of what kind of a mom I was going to be. I was terrified of all the experiences I had had as a young child. I was terrified of what if the damage had been done and what if I passed that on to my kids. I was absolutely terrified. That's huge. I was also terrified about small things that I had no clue about. I was terrified about if I put my son on his tummy and I was supposed to put him on his back, what would happen? I was terrified that if I put him on his back and he was supposed to be on his tummy, what would happen? I was terrified that if I gave him a passy, it would mean that he'd be in therapy when he was 30. I was terrified that if I gave him a bottle over, you know, I, I was just terrified. Cloth diapers, disposable diapers, I mean, knitted blankets, cotton blankets. I was just terrified because I knew nothing. I knew nothing. And then you have that nagging in the back of your head, damaged, can't function, <laughs> won't be able to make it, terrified. And I remember very clearly the night that Scott and I brought our son home. The first night we brought him home from the hospital and Scott was so proud. And he took Declan, that's our firstborn son's name, he took Declan around and he was holding him and he was kind of giving him a tour of the house. Declan, this is the living room, and this is the kitchen. Your mom doesn't like to go in there too much. <laughs> this is your room, and this is your bed, and he laid him down in the bed. And in Declan's room, we also had a little twin bed so that I could be close, we could be close to him. And um, I remember Scott left the room, and I sat on the twin bed, and I just began to weep. And I'm not talking pretty little glistening tears. I'm talking like from my gut, just weeping. I was, t all my fears, all my terrors just came and I just thought, dear God, there is this precious little soul 
laying in this bed, and he's mine. And I'm supposed to raise him. And I was terrified. I was terrified that I was going to damage him. I was terrified that I was going to do something wrong. I was terrified that I was ill-equipped and that I didn't have what it took to be a mom. I was terrified. And in that moment, I sensed the sweet presence of our Savior Jesus so strongly. I sensed him. I sensed him, and he said, he, he said to me, I'm with you. I have got you. You are not in this alone. I have set you free. I have restored you, and I have redeemed you. You are not damaged, and you are not broken, and you can do this. You can do this. That's what our Jesus does for us. It doesn't matter where we come from because what our Jesus does is he restores and he heals and he makes new. He makes all things new. And so because of what he has done in my life, I knew that I could go about, go about this journey of parenthood. Now maybe you're out there and this is heartbreaking for you because you're not a parent and you want to be. Maybe you've not had that, um, that opportunity or for whatever reason you just can't. It hasn't come for you yet, or you're just not able to. And I want to say to you, this absolutely still pertains to you. I have a dear friend, one of my closest friends, who has not yet had her own kids, but she has loved children. She has served children. She has mentored children in the inner city, in this church, in other countries. She has used the heart that God has given her for children to love and inspire and encourage them. And that's what we're all called to do, you guys. Each one of us in this room, whether we're or a physical parent or not, are called to impact and influence the next generation. Whether you're a mother or a father, or an aunt or an uncle, or a mentor or an educator or a grandparent, it does, or just you know a friend of a neighbor kid who roams the streets during the day, we each have the unique gift and responsibility to influence the next generation, to show them what the kingdom is about, to show them what it means to be a Jesus follower. Train a child in the way he should go. I had to hold on to that for comfort, but I was also terrified because I didn't know how to train a child. I didn't know. And I also know that there are people out there, there are people out there, and I have known some of you, that you didn't get very long to train your child. That through whatever circumstances happened, your child left you too soon. That's a heartbreaking reality. That is a part of parenting in this world today. I also know that there are those of you that you tried your best to train up your child. I know that you brought your child to church and you tried to instill in them the word of God and you tried to put them in a good community and you tried to surround them with good people and they still made their own choices and went about their own way. And you don't see yet, you don't see yet God's promise for your child. I know that. But I'm here to say that God did not breathe this scripture for you to feel like you have failed. He did not breathe this scripture for you to feel like you have not done your job adequately. He did not breathe this scripture for those of you who are still waiting to have kids to feel like my time will never come. He had each of us in mind because we each have a role to play in training up a child. We have to remember that no matter what we're going through in our circumstance with our families and with the kids that we come into encounter with, that the reality of parenting and influencing the next generation is not easy, it is not simple, but God is right there with us, empowering us to do the very best job that we can do. I currently have a friend whose five-year-old little girl has cancer five-year-old little girl who has cancer. I cannot tell you how hard I'm praying for that girl, and I believe that God will do what God will do. I do. I believe it, but I know that that's a hard place to be in as a parent. It's a hard place to be in. Parenting is not easy. Loving kids is not easy. Influencing the next generation is not easy. Your heart is continually walking out there, outside of your body, and it could be broken at any moment. It can be joyful, but it can also be heartbreaking, and we know that, and that's why we want to say that this verse is not meant to just be like a bumper sticker that you slap on a situation and call it good. This verse is not meant to bring condemnation because you've, you've done your part to train up your child and you don't see them walking in the way that they should walk. That's not what this verse is about. The problem with reading the Proverbs this way, you know, the magical, magical formula, the vending machine way, is because it, that becomes, when we do that, it takes the scriptures that God breathed, it makes them very transactional, and it takes out the relationship. 
And when we do that, when we make things very transactional, if we do this, then God does that, we are in danger of seeing God as distant and cold. He's not. But that's what we do when we say, well, we have to do this so that God will do that, because then that means that he's distant and cold, and he only blesses us, and he only pays attention to us when we do the stuff the right way. And that puts all the pressure on us to get it right. That is not what God is about. You do not need to take on that pressure of making sure that you do A, B, C, D, just so you get the outcome of God's blessing and God's approval. That is not what he's about. We have to remember that there are other factors at play. We live in a life as kingdom people. We're trying to be light in the darkness, but there is darkness. There's a reason why we're called to be light, because there is darkness. We are kingdom people living in a world that doesn't um, have the domain and rule of God covering it yet. We live in a fallen world. And so what that means is that as kingdom people, we are constantly in a battle, whether we realize it or not. There are things coming against us. There are things coming against our God and what we stand for, our kingdom principles. There are things, there is darkness coming at us, and we're constantly trying to be the light. Many times, our lives get trapped up in that tension of trying to be the kingdom light and the darkness in the world. There are other factors at play. There's free will, you guys. You can do your best. I want to say to you, you can do your best. You can train your child up. And your child may make different choices because they have free will. Eventually, our job as parents is to let our children go. And hopefully, they function in society and do good and are kind and loving and, and God-fearing and do all kinds of amazing things. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we train up our child, and then they go off and do something else. Sometimes if something else is destructive and devastating, but they have free will, just like we have free will. Maybe you trained up your child and sometimes you got it wrong. I get that. <laughs> sometimes we don't get it all right. Why? Because we're imperfect, because we too are living in this fallen world. But, that me but all that means is that we all have free will and there are other things that factor. There is spiritual warfare happening, you guys, for your kids, for the next generation, for our families. There is spiritual warfare going on. There are things that we come against on a daily basis as kingdom people, trying to be the light in this darkness that is coming at us every day. There are other factors at play. It's not just A plus B equals C. It's not just put your money in the vending machine and push the button and get the result. It's not a product. We're living a life as believers. We're living a life trying to advance the kingdom into the world of darkness, you guys. We can only do the best we can with what we've got. We don't always have all the information at hand when we're making choices for our kids, when we're making choices for um, people that we influence and mentor. We don't always have all the pieces to the puzzle. All we can do is trust God in those moments and do the best with what we've got. Trust him in those moments and do the best with what we've got. So what do we do when we're reading this particular proverb? What do we do when we're reading the Proverbs in general or any scripture um, at all? What do we do? We have to keep a few things in mind. We have to keep in mind that we are in a covenant relationship with the Almighty God. We are in covenant relationship, and that means he is continually pledging himself to us. He's continually giving up himself to us, sacrificially loving us, and he's asking us to do the same. He did not write a contract with us. That's not the scripture. The scripture is not a contract, you know, where he spells out his part, and we spell out our part, and we both sign on the dotted line because we don't trust one another. Absolutely not. We serve a God who is madly and passionately in love with each and every single one of us. We serve a God who takes the broken and restores them. We serve a God who takes what seems dead and dry and dull and gives it new life. That's the God that we serve. And when we read scripture, we have to keep that in mind. We are in covenant with this amazing life-giving God who, who longs to set us free. The scripture are, part, is, are a part of his covenant with us. And God's covenant is to continually be partnering with us as we are going about doing what we feel called to do and us continually partnering with him and what he's already at work doing. He is at work in your life. He is at work in the lives of your children, whether you see it or not. And some days it's hard to see. Some days you think uh, there is no part of God in that kid. 
but you have to know God is at work. I mean, and if you don't have, maybe it's a neighbor boy that just, you know, woof, causes all kinds of havoc in the, in the neighborhood, but God's at work. So how can you partner with that? God's at work in, with, in the kids in Costa Rica. How can we partner with that? God's at work, the kids down in Heroes Gate. How can we partner with that? God is at work in the lives of many. How can we partner with that? Part of our role is to train this next generation, to get them started on the right way and to steer them clear of danger. And we have to trust God along the way with our lives and with our family. And we have to trust God in those transitional times and those unexpected times. Because we may think we've got it all worked out. This is how we're gonna do it. This is how we're gonna act. This is how we're gonna uh, behave. This is how we're going to parent. This is how we're going to teach. This is how we're going to live. But gosh, live a few hours in the world and you'll know something will come up that's unexpected and then you have to figure out what next. You gotta trust God in those unexpected moments and in those times of transition. We're gonna close this up, but first I just wanna talk a little bit about what the Proverbs are not. The Proverbs are not absolute guarantees, you guys. The Proverbs are not, I put in my money, I push the button, where is my product? That's not what the Proverbs are about. They are certainly not meant to oppress or make you feel guilty for something that you feel like you haven't done right. That is not what the Proverbs are about. That's not the Father's heart toward you. What I have learned as a parent, as one that was absolutely horrified to be a mom, and I've done it four times now, and I'm still doing it, and I don't even know if I'm going to make it through. <laughs> but what I've learned, I'm human. I make mistakes. I've learned that I absolutely have to rely upon the Father's Spirit and His love for me. I have to allow Him to love me so that I can love my children in the right way. I, what I've learned is I have to trust, and I have to know that He did a work in my life, and that work was complete, and he didn't leave anything undone or unchanged in regards to the healing and the restoration that he did for me. I, I've learned that I had to kind of put away those harsh words of, um, you know, you're damaged and you're not gonna be able to, I've, I've had to put that away. I have learned that I can't always anticipate what my kids are gonna do next and I have to be able to flow with that. I have learned that there are times when my kids just need me to say, I'm sorry. Not too long ago, I had to do that. I had to drive to the school. I had to leave work. I had to drive to the school. I had to pull my two older boys out of class, and I had to say, I'm sorry. I messed up. Your mom got it wrong. You know, I yelled. I shouldn't have yelled. I always want the kids to leave the house in the morning knowing that they're loved, and, you know, you want it to feel good, and you want to send them off on their way. And, you know, it was crazy, and it was hectic, and I blew it, and I yelled, and I felt it. And I had to go, and I had to pull him out of class, and I had to say, your mom got it wrong, and I'm sorry. I've learned to be vulnerable. I've learned to be vulnerable, and I've learned that when I show that to my children, what they are seeing is a woman who fiercely loves them, but will also admit that she made a mistake and will apologize. And hopefully they are learning that they can make mistakes and it'll be okay. They are learning that they can be vulnerable and it'll be okay. And where did I learn that? From my father. <laughs> I learned it from my father. I've learned that I can be vulnerable with him as he has parented me and as I parent my children. And I want to say to us all, whether we're in this room today or we're listening um, uh, on the podcast, that God has equipped you. You are not damaged. You do have what it takes, and you each have a role in training up this next generation. If you don't have children yet, if you are unable to have children, if you don't, that's not what you feel like you're supposed to do, just know that you still have a part to play in being a kingdom person and raising up this next generation. The Father's heart is for him to love us and set us free so that we can love and set others free. The Father's heart is to love you and set you free so that you can love others and help to set them free. We are a part of this family together. And together, we play our part in raising up kingdom people so that we can go forward and be what God has called us to be. I want to pray for you now, and I'm going to ask the prayer teams to come forward. And as we pray, I just want you to hear the Father's heart toward you. Just hear him say that, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. 
I have healed you and made you whole. I have healed the brokenness. I understand your fears. I understand it's tough. I understand life, and I am right there with you. God, thank you that you set us free. Thank you that we are not in bondage to um, what we thought that we had to do. I thank you that we're not in bondage to oppressive things that come against us and tell us that we've messed it all up. I thank you that we're not in bondage to any person or thing that would cause us to believe that we are less than we are, but we are whole and we are free because of who you are and who you desire to be in us through us, with others. God, thank you for your freedom. And I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that every person here would know that they are free. They are free and that they are loved and that they have value and they have something worth giving to others. Pour into our lives, God, so that we can pour into others. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys.